Let me start off by introducing you, Martha Fleming. I'm going to read out uh, just a brief bio that's in the, the publication called The Devil's Artisan. It's issue number 63, and uh, th that's from 2008. And you worked on two issues that were devoted to Canada's greatest Canada's greatest graphic designer, Alan Fleming, your father. So Martha Fleming is an artist, curator, and academic. She lives in the United Kingdom, where she's been a fellow of the National Endowment for Science, Technology, and the Arts, and other research institutions. She is one of Alan Fleming's three children. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Nigel, thank you so much for inviting me. Now, is there anything you want to add to your bio? Well, I might I might just add that I did uh, a degree in the history of the book at the University of London. And I think that was uh, at one and the same time, a kind of culmination of uh, all the things that my father taught me about books and typography and also a funny kind of springboard into developing the methodologies that allowed me to edit those two issues of DA Devil's Artisan about his work and to consider the ways in which graphic design historiography could be developed through case studies such as the work of my dad. Yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it? He was uh, he was very curious and interested in learning about the letter form, particularly uh, the history of it. And there weren't that many programs available to him. So he just decided to up and head to London and actually meet some of the great practitioners and teachers of the day. Yes, that's absolutely true. I think that it was very clear to him that there was no place in Canada that he could get a better education than the one that he already had, which was uh, basically as an uh, illustrator. And he stepped off to meet uh, people like Oliver Simon and Beatrice Ward and uh, Herbert Simon, really attempting to educate himself in a way that was commensurate with the vision that he had for the kind of career that at that time was really not very well understood, stepping beyond the hot metal floor of the typography, of the typographic setting room, and into a world where word and image uh, was fully integrated yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it, that uh, this was in the mid-50s. Uh, a lot of the design work was still being done by by printers. You know, it, it wasn't a, a profession, per se. Yes, the, the graphic designer of the time was more likely to be someone who was uh, working almost as an account manager in a typesetting firm and mm -hmm. uh, uh, being a kind of conceptual or intellectual go-between between the setting client and the the guys in the composing room. And in fact, I think that's sort of what Alan returned to Toronto to do when he took up his post at Cooper and Beatty, which was uh, sort of the composing room of the North, as it were, for that period. It was the very best typesetter in the country, and they hired him as uh, an art director. So there is... Um, as we see sort of through the 50s, the emergence of, you know, literally from the rubble of the composing room floor into uh, a, a more corporate context of, you know, boards of directors or the creation of a, a creative department or, yeah, we, we really start to see the kind of profession that uh, Alan could foresee when he left Canada in 1953, or I think it was 53, to go to England for a couple of years. So when he was there, he worked for advertising firms and, you know, doing layout for uh, record companies like Decca and cosmetic companies like Yardley and so on. And he really, he really sort of cut his teeth in a, a sort of funny 
advertising world while studying at places like the St. Bride's Printing Library and the British uh, Library, actually studying. This was also self-directed, though, right? He would go into their libraries. Is that it? Yes, that's correct. I mean, these were open libraries. They were uh, obviously the British Library is, but also yeah. uh, St. Bride's uh, was basically a professional library. Um, but p- I believe that at the time it was part of the Guildhall Library. So the idea of the typographer as a as a, a guild practitioner is very much to the fore. And uh, one could access these libraries and and literally study not only the books about uh, book design, but actually study the history of book design itself through looking at the history of printing. So he was literally looking at books uh, from incunabula onwards and studying the structure of the the page design, the, the design of type itself. These were the things that he he knew he could find there, and he did. I think he 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 sought the the advice of of people like Beatrice Ward to direct his attention to what he may not have uh, already passed his eyes over. But mm-hmm. um, if yeah. you look in his uh, paper archives, which are at York University, uh, there there are reams and reams of notes from that period that that literally are his own sort of perfect italic hand yes. taking yeah. notes from. A whole range of designers from the 18th, 19th, and 20th century um, whose books he was studying. Well, the other great thing is that he loved books. So he went out and bought a whole bunch of them. But that's what really endears him to me. Yes, it was. I think it was possibly more than a minor addiction <laughs> um, <laughs> well <but> listen <laughs> you in your piece in the in the uh in d a sixty three Alan Fleming at home a partial reconstruction you mentioned a couple of things first of all, the greatest expense of coming home to Canada a year later was the shipping of books yes so uh and then later on in in that same uh, article, you talk about the fact that what there's structural problems like there's cracking in the wall because he's got too many because of the weight of the books on the third floor that's correct (laughs) as any uh book collector will know um one amasses books and then there may be either a (laughs) a a financial reason or a reason having to do with moving house that means that you suddenly divest yourself of some of the most important physical objects that you will ever have owned your books and uh alan alan's books that he bought in england i think at one point he decided that he wanted to uh purchase a country home uh or at least the possibility of it by buying a little patch of land in the caledon hills just outside of toronto and he he made some arrangement with Jack Trevette, who was then the director of Cooper and Beatty, to swap his his uh, collection, uh, which did include a number of incunabula, many of which were were displayed in that exhibition at the Art Gallery of Ontario about the Bible, the typography yes. of the Bible that he did yes. in the fifties. I've got the catalog to that. Yeah, it's a great catalog, and many of those books uh, were the books that Alan brought home from yes. uh, from London. But as he sort of moved towards uh, leaving Cooper and Beatty, he said, "Look, Jack, I'll I'll leave you these books if you give me five grand, and right. I can then buy this uh, this uh, patch of land in the Caledon Hills." <laughs> Unfortunately, the patch of land in the Caledon Hills was harder to keep, maintain, and possibly build on than any book collection might have been and uh i i'm pretty sure that he regretted the swap um uh, you know in in later years but uh he so then he's, what, didn't he didn't he sell the land for another to get a down payment on the, another place i can't remember the exact details but okay. yes there was the currency of books is multiple and sometimes it's mercantile and sometimes it can transform itself into uh, something as prosaic and as important also as property. And I think that was that was the, the alchemy between the books and the property. But uh, books did prevail. And he he uh, also put together a, a, an extraordinary collection of uh, fine press books, particularly from the 
early 20th century that uh, that he was very proud of and that that also informed a lot of the way in which he conjoined modernity and tradition in the work that he did as a designer. Yeah, he's he's got some Doves Press, uh, the Doves Press Goethe and uh, Tennyson and the five volume Bible. Yeah, Doves Press is just magnificent. Yes, and I mean, so for example, he also had a very good relationship to a lot of Toronto book dealers. And uh, in particular to uh, Roderick Brinkman, who had the means to uh, have a, a stock of fine press books that were truly exceptional. And I think Alan designed two or three of yes. Brinkman's catalogs at Monk I, Breton Books. And yes, in fact, I, I was just looking before our, before our uh, conversation, I was scrounging around because I've got one of those. Uh, but I couldn't find it because I was hoping, because I know Alan makes a point or tried to get his name in pretty well everything that he designed. So, which makes it easy for anyone who's interested in him to, to spot his work. But, but I wasn't able to lay my hands on the damn thing. So I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm really interested to see if he, he was, uh, he got his name in there. I think he did. And I think I, I seem to recall particularly the fine press one. And then there was another one on folklore. Uh, okay. I think he did get his name in there specifically. This would have been also a value to the, to the booksellers uh, yeah. because it, it gave a sense that, you know, someone is discerning a, a collector and as discerning as a designer as Alan was yeah. um, had some engagement with the, this uh, some direct engagement with this particular book dealer. I know he traded some of that work for books with, with Roddy. I don't remember what books they were. I, I think I was too young to, <laughs> to really know, but um, yes, they're again, the design swapping for books, you know, the great currency of the book. Yeah, he loved uh, he loved words. I think that was the thing. He loved uh, spoken and and written word and letter form. And I think what's unusual again, I'm trying to get at what made him so great. What is unusual is that he was so apparently. And I I interviewed Robert Fulford some years ago about him. He was so articulate because he'd studied design. And and the and the great predecessors, he was able to bring all sorts of interesting knowledge to the to the table when he was talking about potential projects, and so he was able to meld the the two the the persuasive talk about why a client should go in a certain way based on the you know, just all sorts of knowledge. Yes, yeah, so well, I think that degree of visual literacy that he had was unique and it was it was self developed in the those two issues of DA i think i described some of the some of the accoutrements of the house that included beyond books many antiques that uh had letter forms in them uh vernacular signs or label bottles with special labeling on them he was very interested in uh, the way that each and every locality or time period actually solved this problem of connecting things, ideas, and people through a, a visual language. And he was, he was, uh, as you say, very articulate about the history of that engagement between people, things, and ideas, uh, and how Letter forms form a kind of fusion between image and object that was really viscerally felt by him. I I know that the 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 degree of joy and excitement that he had in rummaging around in um, antique shops or in uh, going every single Saturday to Britnell's and Dave Mason's and with you. Yes, with me and my brother and sister, and yeah, these were the the outings that we had with dad they were they were they were fairly um you know i mean other kids would go and go skiing with their parents or you know have a have a ball game or or something of that nature, but no we we got to go to Britnell's and and dave mason's and I think we 
each of the three of us has a very different uh, way in which we incorporate the things that both of our parents taught us because, you know, our our mom was uh, also quite an extraordinary person, very involved in the book trade, particularly in the latter half of her her life. She worked at the Association of Canadian Publishers and uh, mm-hmm. the Book and Periodical Development Council and was, was a very significant figure in the uh, right to read and pen and uh, various other organizations of that nature because she was administratively very skilled. And I have a hunch that the reason that Alan never opened his own office or whatever Part of the reason for that was simply that Nancy was such a good administrator that as a secret partner to his uh, sort of intellectual and and creative powerhouse, she filled in for a lot of infrastructure that many other people uh, had to construct in the form of an office, uh, a company, etc., that doesn't quite make sense, though. I mean, if she's such a great administrator, it seems to me that'd be perfect to set up a company together. Well, there there was an incorporated company, but I think that Alan was basically more more comfortable for a range of reasons in a salaried post from which he could either choose to be involved in design projects or through which company, like McLaren's or like Cooper & Beatty, uh, projects would fall into his lap. For example, the the CN project, he did that while at Cooper and Beatty, and it cascaded. The, the, the logo project that he was involved in, uh, commissioned by James Valkus, who, who was sort of the lead corporate and uh, technical designer for CN, the kind of work that cascaded into Cooper and Beatty from that logo design was everything from typography for and composition for telegraphs for yeah. for CN's hotel stationery for uh railway tickets for you, you name it the he had this as a freelance job but he brought all sorts of business to the company as a result so no wonder they didn't they feel, they felt okay you can do your stuff on the side because it j- it's good for our business that's absolutely correct. I, it's the only reasonable deduction that, that I've been able to draw for this fact. And, you know, this is also a time, particularly when he's working at uh, McLaren Advertising, this is a time before the, the notion of corporate responsibility, right? So he's, he's doing things like designing the Toronto Symphony Orchestra uh, logo while working at McLaren. Um, but also getting a lot of kudos from the the, the sort of uh, elite cultural establishment for yeah, it's, it's perfect. I mean, it, you know, the, the the connection, the business connections, doing through doing something like that are golden, aren't they? I believe so. I think that's that's really what it was about, and I think it 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 meant that he had more um, job and employment security than he would have had if he were carrying the can for a company his own company, you know, with yes. all of the risks that that entails. Yes. Reflecting on my own, my own career, it was, I was connected with a company, but I also had the freedom to do whatever I wanted. And uh, I, that, that is, you've got the best of both worlds there. I think so. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure that uh, the kind of pressure that uh, the ad man was under in the 1960s could really be conceptualized as freedom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, it does it, it sort of uh, play out in his own health, of course, which is, again, he left us tragically young. What was he like, 48 or something like that? That's correct. He died at the age of 48, which was That's, uh, tragically young. And as you you point out in one of your pieces in the DA here, there are other uh, William Golden, for example, is another. You know, he worked with CBS, uh, very highly regarded. He died young. There's a variety of different different people in the business that died because of stress. Yes, I mean it's it's hard to imagine that 
Well, maybe it's not so hard to imagine that world now. I mean, there are, right, there are right. uh, as I point out in one of the sort of prefaces for those two, dub, that double issue of uh, Devil's Artisan, yeah. there are a lot of similarities now in that sort of flat hierarchy, individual responsibility, um, the, the, the sort of almost nomadic creative that uh, we have now in a post-digital world mm-hmm. is under similar kinds of pressure to the 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 sorts of pressure that that advertising and and brand designers were under prior to any understanding of the corporations that they were working for. Well, many of those corporations did not understand how to do in-depth research, either in terms of the way the corporation saw itself or the way that cl- uh, customers saw the corporations. So they were actually doing the work that, let's say, in the 1980s or 1990s at a company like Cassette, you would have 300 people working yes. on yeah. a project like the CN or Ontario Hydro or uh, any number of the the larger scale and, and even national projects that Alan worked on. The, the idea that uh, you could do that kind of work as a one-man band or as uh, maybe five or six people the way Valkus worked on the CN project with you know some some of the uh, really great sort of product and application designers and logo designer of their time you know and they were they were just five guys I mean yes yeah it's it, I mean puts me in mind of Paul Rand I mean he was probably one of the pioneers in the in the 50s or for late 40s early 50s and and that's also very interesting what Alan you did he put together these little exhibitions at Cooper and B on important designers such as Paul Rand and uh, Zapf I think he did Herman Zapf as well he he, he did and that was this this was just for his own edification or for client edification or just, what was, why did he do those? Well, I think, I think there were a couple of things going on there. Uh, it was partly uh, to network for the, for Cooper and Beatty and also for himself. These guys are uh, particularly Zap. They're designing type. Yes. They're not just designing graphic design. They are no, actually no. designing entire typefaces. So yeah. There's also the possibility that those uh, type designers would be able to plead the case of Cooper and Beatty if Cooper and Beatty was wanting to uh, buy at some discount rate uh, new type, for example. Yeah, could you tell me exactly what it is that Cooper and Beatty did? Basically, Cooper and Beatty was a typesetting and composition house. So they sold type. So uh, if someone uh, wanted to have a book typeset or an ad typeset or something, anything that was going to be printed had to be uh, yeah. compositionally typeset. So sorry, taken from either a manuscript or a typewritten that basically transferred to what it's going to look like in the finished product. Correct. So uh, and and someone. Uh, would have to, as they say, call that type, which means decide what font it was to be set in or number of fonts, what weight of, uh, of type in order to fit the financial requirements and the aesthetic requirements of the client. So if a client comes to you and says, I'm doing a piece of advertising, it's got to be two pages of eight and a half by 11 folded, because that's all I can afford to print. I'm going to need 5,000 copies of it. Here's the text body. Can you make it look good and fit that economy, you know, economical, um, yeah, that the, that financial. Um, so you're talking about a brochure, for example, like a. Yeah, a, something yeah. like that. Or an advertisement. Yes, or an advertisement. And, and so then what the type company is interested in advertising is their skill in advertising. So there are a lot of ads that Alan designs for Cooper and Beatty to basically demonstrate their skill in making ads, in calling the type that would uh, fit, you know, a quarter of a page in a magazine like print magazine, for example. So this this kind of um this kind of activity is basically what they're undertaking and it means that they are wanting to 
to buy type, both from the US and from Europe, and having someone like Zap come in and present his graphic design and also his typographic design means that you you create a sort of network, you uh, you advertise the best in European design to your clients, you make a direct connection with the designer that might mean that you could get the actual type itself, you could buy it cheaper than if you went to the monotype corporation or, you know, the, these things are very tight though, because the typesetters and compositors are uh, a very, very highly organized union. So I think this also had an impact on the way that graphic design as a profession emerged from typography. So, but that's, you know, that, that is a whole history that's yet to be told. And I would love some historian of design to actually look at the compositors and typesetters unions and see how they are affected by these enormous shifts that that uh people like McLuhan start talking about it that in that time period in in the relationship between these sort of almost feudal uh old world guilds and the fast pace of of uh typographic advertising yeah you're kind of losing me here because <laughs> The, well, it's not about Alan. <laughs> it is no, about no. Alan. No, <laughs> I know it's not, but it's, it's. I think it's important to understand the company that he worked for in that crucial period. Correct. And so what did they, they basically employed people to lay out these pages and then they sent the the actual type to the printers? Correct. And these people that did this laying out, they were part of a union? Yes, it was a very powerful union. And so Al- and union. Basically, the, they would, Cooper and Beattie would go out to the client. They would say, look, we've got all these different options here, typefaces. We've also got a designer who, uh, you know, knows how to make this stuff look great. So then you agree with the client, yes, that you present, yes, this is what we're going to do. And then you send instructions to these unionized people to actually lay out the pages in the way that you've instructed them to. And then they they then send it to the printer. That's grosso modo. That's pretty much it. Yep. And Alan was developing this sort of really there hadn't been any sort of expertise in that space uh, until uh, the the period that he sort of steps in, really. He's a a pioneer of this thing. Yes, I think that's true. The other the other person who was affiliated with Cooper and Beattie uh, a little bit prior to Alan um, and who also went to Europe to study is Carl Dare. Design, is it Design for Type, uh, the book that he wrote in 52? Yes. So, uh, but Carl was more interested in designing type and Alan was more interested in using typography as part of graphic design. Right. right. So they were very complementary, And I think they both taught each other a lot. And there are, there are these amazing um, letters from uh, Dare back to people like Alan in Toronto uh, uh, when he is uh, in Antwerp uh, at Enschede, actually learning uh, Carl Dare how to, how to cut metal type yes there's a film on that isn't there the punch oh really oh i'd love to see that i think there's a film that he was involved in making dare was yeah but uh, okay i see so so just yeah that's good to know that that the two of them were uh were connected and and uh was would you say that dare was a mentor or a, a colleague or what well i think i think at this point these guys are are co-mentoring each other. Yeah. I think Dare uh, was a little bit older, but for example, Alan bought a, yes. a Plantin Press for yes. Carl. He um, shipped he was, it over, right? That's right, while he was living in London and had it shipped back to, yeah. to Carl to Toronto. So they're helping each other out at a time which is almost... Uh, in communication terms, almost inconceivable now where, you know, letters take six weeks to arrive from one place to another. And, uh, you know, there, yeah. there's, a, there's much less information 
in lo certain localities than is available now online, certainly. So you dare died young too of a, a heart attack or some such, uh, right right around uh, Centennial, didn't he? I think that's right. I I don't know much about. Uh, about Carl Dare, but there is, uh, I believe that there's an issue of DA of Devil's Artisan about Carl Dare as well. I right. mean, I must say that Devil's Artisan as a as a publication is uh, quite an important sort of standard bearer for Canadian graphic design and typography and its multiple histories. Yeah, I was delighted to be able to publish with them, and yeah, yeah, I've got a. Almost got a full run. There's some some in, down in the 30s that are damn hard to find. But <laughs> uh, okay, so getting back to Alan, then uh, he worked with Cooper and Beatty. But we should, yeah, we talked a bit about uh, Canadian uh, National CN. I think it's a little bit typical, sadly, uh, uh, ironic that CN hired an American who turned around and hired a Canadian. To be, the American was hired what as a kind of a brand manager or a, someone who was responsible for the overall what redesign of the corporate look of CN, and and, and Alan was just hired for the logo. Is that it? I think that's basically it. Uh, right. But I, I think that sort of simplifies uh, what was an incredibly productive and dynamic relationship. I mean, Volkus was uh, uh, at the time, and I believe he's still alive, actually, oh, oh. an extraordinary person. Volkus was a real sort of cultural mover and shaker uh, in New York at the time and had uh, had a club and a number of other sort of shops and and things and he he really sort of uh embodied a kind of energy that uh was unique to that period i mean he had uh, a modernist vision for canadian national railways that was almost pitch perfect he he mm -hmm. sort of understood the sort of power of the conglomerate because it was not just the railway it was telegraphs yes. it was hotels it, it yeah was, that's why they took the r off didn't they yeah it was shipping uh it, yeah. it was it was one of the biggest national corporations in the world yeah and uh he he sort of understood how you go about understanding that kind of corporation that was his genius and he also knew how to go and find the best people to work with right. and how to get them to work pretty much 24 seven to make this thing happen. <laughs> There's one image that, that I found in Alan's papers. It's a slide, basically a 35 millimeter uh, transparency slide showing Jim Valkus in the Montreal studio that he rented in order to, to work closely with CN, whose headquarters were in Montreal. And he's standing against a wall absolutely covered with different design stripings for the sides of railway carriages. And he's just having a quiet smoke. <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> the, the dynamism that's coming off that guy is just astonishing. So, you know, the, these, are two, these are two men who managed to find each other um, well, I was going to say, I think, again, part of the, the, the genius, if you want to call it that, of uh, Alan is just self-promotion, getting himself into position to being found like that. Well, I mean, he, you know, he attended things like the Silvermine Conference on typography or, you know, he was quite involved in, uh, yeah. he would always go to Aspen. These are really significant networking opportunities. And when... Jack Trevette at Cooper and Beatty had uh, a little bit of extra money. He would send Alan South to the yeah, yeah. Uh, AIGA meetings and the Type Directors Club of New York. And as you say, he was very articulate. He was also he was also very handsome, and yeah. he managed to convey uh, a kind of uh, self assurance that that maybe belied. Yeah, I don't think that he always felt that self-assurance, but he was able to convey it. This is how he ended up 
being so well respected uh, in the states and probably where he met where he met Jim Valkus. Well, the other thing too is that he gets involved. You know, like he, he this is I just picked up as I showed you uh, the other day. I picked up, he he actually designs stuff for AIGA. So he he's able to go in there and and make an impression, but then also stay involved and have his name there because he's a designer and he can he can make an impact, can't he? Absolutely. And again, I think it's I think it's that relationship with Cooper and Beatty as a typesetter that means that uh, they they want him at the AIGA because if they've got uh, type for sale and the uh, Alliance of uh, American Graphic Designers is noticing their creative director at Cooper and Beatty and the kind of typographic work that is coming out of uh, Cooper and Beatty in Toronto at that time that might uh, well garner them jobs and and uh, larger projects because it's the really big corporate projects where typesetting is important, where you're doing everything from, you know, the, the sides of buses on down to people's business cards. That's the kind of typesetting that makes money for a, um, for a composing room at that time. And again, Cooper and Beatty, basically, they had to have a library, a big library of fonts that they could then offer and say, yeah, we've got this wide range of possible looks for you and and we can produce this this for you. Correct. And, And again, just thinking and prior to the computer age, does that mean that it's the actual hard (laughs) <laughs> metal type, metal type that, um in some cases sort of... it's metal type but um there's also uh mainly people are setting in hot metal uh, through linotype and then monotype monotype that's machines. right exactly yeah. but also at this time film type setting is starting to come in there was a there was a whole sort of project with flexi type that enabled you to literally use a piece of printed plastic to warp or twist uh, typography that had already that had already been set so by photographing it and twisting it twisting the piece of film so these kinds of innovations are starting to happen but actual photo type setting uh, wouldn't come in until much later until the sort of 1980s and by that time uh, I'm afraid Alan was dead so there are a number of kind of transitions in typography, uh, the technicalities of typography that also open up new creative possibilities that I think he was more interested in experimenting with when he moved to um, McLean's magazine, which was his next big move after Cooper and Beatty. Yeah, let's let's move on to that. But just one final question about this. So did they actually send the metal type to the printer? They did the layout. Did they actually then send these pages like metal type to the printers? Yes. So in other words, if they have clients all around North America, they actually ship these things to their no, printers? Probably, no, they probably, uh, probably the, they would help the client to commission a printer who was near them and purchase paper that was near them. So for example, they had a good relationship with Reed Paper, which was a big paper manufacturer in Ontario at the time. There were a number of uh, printing houses that were used very, very regularly. So sometimes the design director, someone like Alan, would also suggest to the client that this paper would fit this typography we know how to get it and this printer has it in stock and we'll give you a good deal. These are also very important networks that Alan had and uh, he maintained a very good relationship with Ernie Herzig of Herzig Somerville, which was the big color printer at the time. And in fact, I think Herzig Somerville had the first color scanner in the country. What does that mean? Well, um, now scanners you can have them pretty much as part of your your desktop printer but at the time scanning and rasterizing images and turning them into 
bits of film that could be printed color was actually, um, you know, we're talking about a, a machine that's the size of your bedroom. I mean, these, these are, these wow. are huge machines and, yeah. and Herzig Zomerville had one of the first ones. So CMYK printing using, yeah, these, these are technical questions. No, it's okay. We're good yeah. with that. Actually that print, that company, they printed the, the great book that we'll get to that, uh, the, the centennial book, Canada a year in the land. They printed that, I believe. I think that's true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on to McLean's. Uh, and that would have been 1962. And, uh, here's the beautiful, I've got a couple of these. The, the actual first, well, it's uh, when he took over as director. There's some others prior to this, but the cover is November the 3rd, 1962. And I think it just speaks to to exactly how uh, Alan operated. He incorporates the letter form into the design and it, it that is, is connected, of course, to the to a, the message. So here we have forty months to make or break Canada, and it's sort of like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and the A in Canada is falling off a ledge. And then at the very bottom, can we avoid union with the USA? And again, it, we talk about how important. He is to the the idea of Canada. He's just right in there doing stuff that's so relevant to the the, the making of Canadian uh, culture and identity, isn't he? Yes, I think that's true. Um, he 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 had a very ardent love for Canada and as a country in a way that I think was possible in the 1960s when everything was to be played for with regard to Canadian subjectivity and identity and cultural life. And these are the years in which the, the Canadian flag is redesigned when we have Expo 67. Um, This is all very hopeful post-war stuff. And it's before a period of sort of economic stagflation in the late eighties and early nineties that, that mean that, those sorts of visions appear to have the costs that they do and the emergence of an an understanding of Canada as a a sort of post-colonial structure and ways in which that doesn't work. But in the 1960s, I think those sort of hopeful thoughts and feelings that were a sort of post-war socially liberal rather than economically liberal world was uh, something that Many Canadians in that sort of elite cultural world that Alan uh, moved in were terribly excited by and wanted desperately to uh, move in the right direction. And this involved, uh, for example, uh, advertising companies like McLaren, which he worked for after working with McLean's in very close collaboration with the, the Liberal Party, with Trudeau, with uh, Judy LaMarche and the creation of the, uh, the 1967 Expo with books like Canada, a Year of the Land. These were all nation building projects. Um, and Alan was involved in in all of them to some degree. But I think that that cover of Maclean's that that uh, you're talking about uh, is one that does express the the sort of anxiety of Canadian identity faced with the you know the elephant next door, which has also uh, perhaps reared its head more in the past you know five years than it has at any other time since the 1960s. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I've got this theory that uh, Canada's last hope for independence. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of focusing in on Walter Gordon, the great economic nationalist, who everyone on the right thinks just screwed up and made sort of silly suggestions and that never would have worked. But his budget at 63 suggest you know came up with suggestions on how to curb american direct investment in the country and the liberal party his own liberal party laughed it 
laughed it out of Parliament. I think that was the end of it myself, uh, even though there was this, as you say, build up to Expo 67. I think that was all window dressing. We'd sold out by that point. But anyway, this is interesting. Alan was involved with, to some extent, the redesign of the CBC logo. He had designed some of the first uh, Canada Council annual reports, which I have. Yeah, he just seemed to be, he seemed to be everywhere, didn't he? I think in a way he was often, he was often someone who was uh, creating the framework for something to come into being. And that's Mm -hmm. reflected very much in the article in the Devil's Artisan uh, issues that Brian Donnelly writes about um, the Hudson's Bay logo. This is not strictly a national project in the way that Expo 67 was or the Canadian no. flag was, but in a similar way to his involvement in those kinds of projects, he was in the background at uh, yeah. McLaren Advertising, creating the design briefs, the conceptual framework, the considerations, advising on a completely silent partner basis. And you know, there there is actually uh, quite a lot of detail about the relationship between McLaren Advertising and the, the Hudson's Bay Company uh, and McLaren Advertising and the Liberal Party in the archives of McLaren Advertising that were deposited at the Ontario Archives at York University. So I've been through that material and it uh, it's really interesting to see the degree to which memoranda quotes for work, literally what McLaren will do and for how much money includes uh, information about uh, design frameworks, about uh, corporate corporate research. That's also true uh, with regard to the CBC symbol where Alan and Bert Kramer spend a lot of time uh, with the CBC as a corporation, not just uh, floating on the top, but actually going deep and interviewing people who are working for the corporation, not just managerially, but also technically and so on. You mentioned uh, Bob Fulford. I mean, I, I remember Bob commenting that he had been surprised to see Alan uh, at one point at sort of two o'clock in the morning in the Saskatoon airport in 1962. And it turns out that he'd been out there basically semi-secretly working for the Liberal Party to uh, get the Liberals into uh, Saskatchewan. Was that Thatcher? Uh, no. Um, Could be. Uh, I know. I think I put the, that detail into his the sort of uh, narrative uh, biography, uh, year by year biography that I, I put into yeah. uh, DA62. But it's just to give you a sense of the degree to which Alan was involved in these projects as a cultural and visual, as it were, guru, without there actually being the necessity or even the desire for uh, on, on the part of particularly McLaren advertising for him to be uh, credited. I mean, I know now that there are uh, very clear laws about the relationship between advertising companies and politics and political parties. That wasn't the case in the 1960s, and none of them were doing anything that was uh, that was in any way illegal, but it, it was influential. And as far as they were concerned, this was an influence for good. This had to do with the creating of a fair and just and socially responsible and economically viable Canada. And that included things like the flag and Expo 67. Yeah, I think you're a little bit more sanguine than I am about this, but uh, and more forgiving of the the elite, perhaps. But it clearly it it drove it drove Alan and genuinely he had a genuine love of, of the country. But you know, what's so interesting is that you know, his influence is pretty significant. And it, you know, it's thankfully we've got, uh, we've got ephemera and, uh, books that we can, we can collect. But, um, you know, 
he, his name isn't as well known as perhaps it should be. I mean, that's partly why we're doing this. Would you say that's true? Or did, I mean, uh, during his life, he certainly got the rec- he got a lot of recognition. He won a lot of awards. You know, he he was recognized for uh, the shaper of our identity. Um, I think that these things ebb and flow, but I think they are also subject to the sort of historiographic skills that are or are not present in the people who are looking at and making history, as it were. I think it's also true that it's much, it's much easier to forget the dead than uh, <laughs> there are yeah. many who are, who are still, you know, with uh, really exceptional careers of their own, who are still out there blowing a trumpet and more power to them. But I, I also believe that, yeah, it's, he, he was not someone to, a lot of the work that, that he did that, uh, uh, at the time was understood to be of great value. And a lot of the things that he did were behind the, the scenes. So I think he did a lot more stuff than, than people actually think. And I also think that, as I mentioned, that People just don't have the historiographic skills that they need in order to really analyze those conditions of production, the kinds of people who uh, were commissioning Allen, what sort of reasoning they had behind them, who the competition was, who the collaborators were, how he moved from one world to another. So sort of moving from typography, typographic design into magazine design and then into advertising and then into book design i mean to chop and change in a portfolio career like that you know even today that's really hard to do and maintain a sort of record of of achievement that appears to have the coherence that it may have conceptually for the individual but i've also noticed that in terms of history of graphic design yeah uh, there's a lot of anecdote you know there's a lot of so and so says this and so and so confided that in me and you know so you you end up with um with a series of sort of shifting sands and a kind of rashomon uh <laughs> narrative to uh what happened or didn't happen in 1960 and 1970 and even 1980 i mean there needs to be uh, a much more rigorous historiography of design well, internationally, but particularly in Canada, where the idea of being an historian of graphic design is that you go and see an old designer and you ask him what happened. I mean, <laughs> I, I just, as someone who's done a couple of degrees, I know that's just not rigorous enough methodology. So, yeah, you yeah. have to be. I was going to say, I've, sp- I've just spent the summer in the Czech Republic. I can't get over the number of monographs and books there are on book designers and and graphic designers in that country of 10 million people i mean it's it's just a, just a completely different level of appreciation and uh, valuing of the, this aspect of culture yes i think i think that is a, a feature particularly in eastern europe middle europe <laughs> where you there, there really is uh, uh, a great sense of the importance of products and product design, architectural design, housing design, yeah. graphic yeah. design. These are the um, literally the the fabric that knits together uh, a society and its and expresses its aspirations, both cultural and social, and, and even mm. economic. So uh, it is something that sort of seems not to have followed on in Canada from from that period. I mean, there, there are a couple of films uh, mm. that have been made uh, recently about Canadian graphic design that are, you know, I'm glad that they were made. I, yeah. I wish that they had been... Uh, the, visually, uh, the visually impressive, uh, the, the, not much more, though. 
Well, in, in terms of, of actual historiography, I, I would have liked to see deeper research, but it's great that they're out there and they're so, totally exuberant, agree. you know, they're yeah. exuberant and, uh, yeah. and exciting and they're excited by design and, totally. and by that design history. But one of the reasons that I, I did those two issues of DA was, you know, in the hopes that I could put at the disposal of cultural historians in general, the kinds of scholarly apparatus that would be required for someone to actually go and do real research. Yeah. Uh, and that hasn't happened yet, but I'm still hopeful. <laughs> well, let's just uh, sort of winding down. This is a program about, about books. Alan, I think he at one point says that really this is what he's always wanted to do is something serious. And, and this is, uh, and this is to design books. This is what he considered to be really serious work. And he, he was kind of glad to get out of the rat race, the advertising rat race. Uh, and he landed, uh, he took a pay cut and went to the University of Toronto Press. Uh, and at that point, I think it was the fourth largest university press on, uh, you know, on the continent uh, of North America. Now that's mid 60, 67, 68. Is that where it is? It's 1968, yes. Yeah. And they pretty much created the post of uh, chief of design. It was negotiated and discussed at the very highest level at the university because, um, yeah. of course, they had a design office that was functioning to produce books uh, with some really great designers, by the way. But it, it didn't have a, a sort of overall director or someone who could actually uh, structure as it were, a brand for scho- for scholarly publishing. So yeah, yeah. Um, amazing people like Laurie Lewis were already working yes. there. Yes, I'm yeah. so happy to have interviewed Laurie. Yeah, well, and no, Will Ruder, and Will Ruder, of exactly. course. Exactly, and yeah. Ante Lingner, you know, who who was actually trained in exactly the the kinds of places that you've just been researching book history in. I mean, she she was Transylvanian. Yes. And she had had the most astonishing uh, training and was a, a really brilliant designer. So he had the most wonderful colleagues to work with. But I think it's true that he had always wanted to design books. And that was why he went to uh, went to London in 1953 to uh, to spend time with uh with people people like herbert simon and and uh beatrice ward so between 53 and 68 there's what not that many years 12 yeah. years and he by that time he had ripped through cooper and Beatty, mclean's magazine mclaren advertising and finally ended up in the place that he wanted to be in at the very beginning um, um, it's not to yeah. say that he didn't design any books before he worked for U of T, because he certainly did. Yes, in fact, his cover of, what is it called, Suit of, Suit of Nettles, that won, uh, I think that won the Governor General's Award, but I think he won uh, some kind of award for the design of the cover. That's correct. But, this is the James Rainey book. 57, 58, thereabouts. Yes, and that would have been done through Cooper and Beatty. So you're you're right. sort of seeing... You're seeing the, uh, you know, little sprouts of him wanting to design books and being able to do it at the composing room. Yeah. But, um, yeah, but actually being chief of design at at, uh, U of T Press, I think, was a dream come true for him. It meant that he could do really exciting work and design innovation that is structurally uh, still even there for uh, even still there to this day. For example, the uh, writings of Erasmus, which is still being published by U of T Press, is still yeah. following the design that, that he created for it. And that yeah. included a, a really astonishing um, innovation, which is to use images as footnotes. Yes, yes. And that was a collaboration, of course, with the editorial group at uh, U of T Press. And he had you know, for the first time in his life, I think a much closer relationship between word and image, um, certainly than he would have had in advertising, because we can see in his papers, uh, a number of a number of attempts while he was at McLaren advertising to bring closer together the the copy editors and the creative, this what was called at the time, the art studio. And 
break down those rivalries between word and image. And of course, that was that was very far sighted in terms of where advertising needed to go. But I don't know how successful he was in pleading that case. He definitely did that at McLean's too. And you, I just I'm glad I just want to mention uh, Ken uh, LaFolle, who recently yes. died. LaFolle was like 93, I think. But uh, I'm I'm so impressed with him too. He was yeah. really a uh, uh, you know, he didn't shy away from controversy. He was, uh, and the two of those together, I think Fulford mentioned that that period, those year, year or two that they were together on McLean's at 62, 63, that's, those are the issues that I've been going after quite diligently because I, you know, they do represent a real high mark, I think. I think that's true. Uh, And, you know, one could argue, and I I think I started out with that by saying that the the thing that really drove him was uh, that relationship between word and image and word as image. But at U of T Press, uh, he was really able to live that in a way that was fully consequent, that the relationship between editorial and design that he was able to uh, improve upon and, and develop became one that that produced some, some uh, again, a high mark of, of uh, scholarly publishing in North America in that in that period. And people like Bob Toombs have a have a good sense of the the sort of influence. Um, Cameron Poulter also in um, uh, in the States uh, of how how much Alan's work at U of T uh, and the, the great team that he had working with him made an impact on the, you know, pull up your socks in design terms that took place in the 70s in uh, scholarly publishing in the US of A. And, you know, that produced some really amazing and uh, substantially powerful publishing houses like MIT Press, you know, which mm. was not uh, uh, particularly well designed in the 60s. And yeah, it's a whole it's a whole world that I think he helped uh, influence through his collaborations with uh, designers and editors who were uh, working with him and under him at, at U of T Press. Yeah. And in fact, again, this is so typical of him because he when he gets involved in a, in a place or an organization, he works on their, you know, things like newsletters and invitations. And, and in fact, one of the pieces that he des- he redesigned the, now what is it? Scholarly publishing or there's a, there's a mag, there was a journal. He redesigned or designed that originally. So that's a great way for him to, yes. And I have, I have that. Uh, I have a copy yeah. of that. You know, you're absolutely right. Scholarly publishing as a as a journal was one of the conduits through which uh, he deeply influenced uh, yes. the design of scholarly publishing in North America. You know, his commitment to the places that he worked in and yeah. the people who worked there was total. And and I think it it was part of what, yeah, what took a toll on his health was his sort of 120 percent approach to wherever he was working and whatever he was doing. And he was also a, an, an amazing change manager, which is, of course, now recognized as a, not only a talent, but also a set of skills. And you're right that uh, he did that through, you know, the the monthly newsletter that he, he wrote for people in the composing room at Cooper and Beattie that basically sort of gave them a sense that the design department, the creative department at Cooper and Beattie was not a threat to compositors and typographers, but actually an opportunity to demonstrate the true power of the printed word. So yeah, that that kind of uh, softly, softly teaching alongside the teaching that he did at the Ontario College of Art and Design has had a very uh, long tail and has been very influential in a way that yeah, is has perhaps not uh, been fully recognized. I think the other thing too is he, in, with with these communications vehicles and the, you know the writing that he did in them. I mean, uh, and and his leadership skills. 
Uh, he's able to uh, sort of infuse a purpose into the organization and to also talk about the importance of what what they're doing, you know, what we're doing here. This does have importance. I guess it's going to take time for <laughs> the the scholarly community to maybe buy into this, but but really the the way things look are often, you know, in terms of power of communication, just as important as the as what's uh, what's said. I think that's that's definitely true, and it wasn't necessarily a, a, a given that people understood that there had to be a, a, a direct link between you know the medium and the message, which was yeah. you know another great uh, another great thinker from that period. But also that there is there's a direct link between social purpose and uh, the aesthetics of the cultural products that relate to those purposes and. I don't know if he would have expressed it in quite that way, but uh, but there that does require leadership. It does require change management. It does require bringing a better infrastructure and underpinning to the relationship between people who are working in words and people who are working in images. And that's something that you see in advertising. You see it in scholarly publishing. You see it in magazine production. Mm-hmm. You see it when your graphic designer trying to wed concepts to the page. And he was able to help people see a future to those uh, links, but conceptual and aesthetic links between the word and the image that, that were coming down the line and that he helped also to bring into being. Uh, it seems to me that it's kind of an obvious observation, but he's, he was just smart. He was <laughs> very smart and obviously curious, and he did the research. Plus, he had a whole bunch of books that you know he was able to rely on. But that's what you need to be a great designer. It's like you need smarts. It's a bit like T.S. Eliot talking about literary critics. What's the criteria? You just have to be really, really smart. I mean, it's kind of obvious, but it seems to me that that's why he stood out as a uh, as a designer. Yes, he was. He was a very intelligent man, and he had a kind of intelligence about uh, popular culture. You know, everything from the influence of the Bible on print down to what comics meant and what the advent of the whole sort of folk movement movement in the States could mean in terms of how people felt about their own bodies of knowledge or their own, their own identities. Well, he was so interested in music too, in folk music. And and you mentioned that he introduced the Beatles to several (laughs) <laughs> yes, several and people, you know. I I remember going to the the late great Sam the Record Man in Toronto yeah, with right. Alan uh, on one of his Saturday trawls, and he was looking for Patti LaBelle, and I was looking for Laura Nero, and uh, to his great joy, Sam was able to take us to one record that we could share, which was Laura Nero's Gonna Take a Miracle, which she made with uh, Patti LaBelle. So, you know, he 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 really did have not only the smarts in the history, but he also had a feel for contemporary culture, not in a in an analytical way that someone like McLuhan did, but in an an actual visceral how is this moving where is it going i mean he read magazines like ramparts and yeah you yeah. know the whole earth catalog and you know we we were exposed to the the most extraordinary sort of blast of 60s and 70s culture in the childhood that my brother and sister and i had mm. and it's something that i'm forever grateful to and and also grateful to him for what he was able to demonstrate to us uh, about being self-taught that yes, you can, you can go to school, you can get your degrees, but you have to seek out the information that will be vital to you in order to develop your uh, interests, passions, knowledge, and understanding. 
you can't mm-hmm. teach that kind of curiosity. It's it's you you can get an education, but so many people do, after they've gotten their education, they figure, okay, well, I'm done now. But it's a lifelong thing. It's something that's innate. You either have this urge to learn or you don't. Well, I think that's partly true, but there's a middle ground, which is uh, simply that for many people, it's hard to find the courage, the wherewithal and the risk taking to go and find what you need that might be above and beyond what you've learned elsewhere. Yeah. And that would, you know, what you've learned in school or in university or uh, in trade school or whatever, because the thing that Alan conveyed to me was that you, you must take a risk to find out what you need to know and it's okay to do that and you must have the courage to do that it's what he did when he went to the states in the 19 uh, when he went to london in the 1950s when he went to the states in the 1960s to connect with his peers it's uh what he did when he moved from one career to another in what what was conceptually coherent as a career but in terms of the the jumping around (laughs) I'm not sure I'm not sure people really recognize what it took to leave an advertising company and be able to land a job in scholarly publishing I mean you know that that's those achievements are based on his drive and his vision and he moved from one thing to another and he went and got the information that he needed and he sought out the peers and collaborators that he wanted and it was a great example. Uh, I really learned so much, not only from him as a child, as a young person, but also in researching his life in order to do these two issues of Devil's Artisan. I really got a sense of, oh, that's what he was teaching me. That's what he was talking about. I understand now. Yeah, I'm not going to leave it uh, on this, but... You do reference the fact that at uh, at some point towards the end, he uh, has an affair and takes off with a younger woman. Uh, speaking of risk taking, you know, it, obviously that 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 is damaging to the parties involved, but it also speaks, I think, to his nature or. Maybe the fact that he he you know he he felt that needs weren't being met and he and he went after them and it's funny because I had a conversation with someone about this and they thought that maybe because of the fact that he did this it may have harmed his reputation and in the whatever community I I I just what what are your thoughts on that whole thing? Well, the. Uh... Yes, he he left the family. He left uh, my mother and he moved in with uh, Prudence Tracy. Now, Prudence was actually one of the editors at U of T Press. So right. in some strange way, uh, this this uh, word and image relationship was merging. Happening. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> actualized in in this um, in right. this love affair. And yeah, um, yeah. Alan was also quite quite seriously unwell by then and I think oh, okay. that he knew that he he may not have many years left to live and uh also it was sort of midlife crisis I mean the guy was totally. in his 40s yeah. I think these were these sorts of um moves yeah there were a bunch of that's that was the way people were leading their lives then um I think uh there was a lot of moving around between partners uh, in a sort of madman kind of uh, way of the world. But I think that he really did uh, care very much for Prudence. And they had about 18 months together before Alan died. That's very unfortunate. But I I can't, I can't see it really affecting his, um, I can't see it really affecting his career. It certainly affected uh, a lot of his friendships and his relationship to his family. But I think it was just part, as you say, it was part of the man he was, and he he was not uh, he was not a saint. He was uh, just a, a really amazing and interesting human being with all the faults that we all have, and uh, a sort of health problems that that um, related to the conditions of work that that were 
really unbelievably stressful and sort of crash and burn stuff. I mean, he's not the only guy who, uh, as you mentioned, who died young, who was uh, uh, working in either corporate design or advertising or uh, that that whole field. So I still think that it's an amazing legacy. And and I still feel it as as an individual who was close to him. And I'm sure that there are many of his friends. In fact, I know there are many of his friends still alive who hold their many conversations and times with him in, in great esteem. And also people who were students of his who have also now gone on to teach and, and practice. Yeah, who, who still hold a candle for the old guy. Well, thank you for illuminating uh, with words his uh, person. I think he was extraordinary. And it's so enriching for me to think about him and uh, and admire his uh, his work. Uh, that's the, the, the great thing about books and, and magazines and his legacy. It's uh, you can you can go out there and you can you can get a hold of it. Thank you for uh, for joining me. Well, Nigel, it's a it's a pleasure, and I think uh, Bibliophile uh, is a really fantastic podcast. And there's just so much information on it, and so so much uh, listening pleasure to be had from it that I'm I'm I hope I've been able to add to it. <laughs> you definitely have, and, and it's been a real pleasure. So, thank you, uh, Martha Fleming, for uh, for being here. Great. And can you just give me a little extra uh, who you are, what you're doing now, and uh, what you'd like to to do in the future? Well, at the moment, I'm working in the Natural History Museum of Denmark, where we're looking at uh, some historical collections and their present day meanings for various various cultures, including the cultures that, that these collections were made in when uh, Denmark uh, colonized uh, bits of Ghana, bits of the West Indies, bits of India. So we're, we're looking at colonial collections and seeing how they, what they mean today, particularly uh, herbarium collections. Mm. I personally have sort of tried to conjoin my interest in history of collections, history of science, and global history in a way that, yeah, brings new new meanings to uh, old things. And uh, that's, so that's what I'm up to now. Are you in Denmark? Right now I am, yes. Uh, I have a, a research grant and um, an associate professorship. And for the next few years, that's what I'll, I'll be working on, um, going back and forth between London, COVID permitting and Copenhagen. But I have, I have spent a lot of time in museums in the, in the past, uh, couple of decades that I've worked at the V&A in London and also the science museum there, the natural history museum, but I've been teaching as well, which I've, I've really enjoyed. And, uh, I often think of Alan when I'm teaching that, the how how quickly teaching becomes mentoring when your your students become go out into the world and do wonderful things well i can tell you're a chip off the old block too a little bit so thanks again it's been a real pleasure great nigel thank you so much okay take care you too bye